one. Give me one moment, folks. So for those of you who just joined us, good morning again. My name is Ian Andrews. I'm the executive director at Lakewood Alive. I'll be uh, with you today running from Mission Control here, our uh, PowerPoint, uh, and I'm pleased to introduce our Housing and Internal Operations Director, Alice Urbanic. Go ahead, Allison. All right. Well, thank you all so very much for joining us today. Uh, today is our inaugural Knowing Your Home webinar. Uh, so if you could raise your hand, that's on the right hand of the screen um, near the little my um, special go-to webinar little button. There's a little hand. If you could raise your hand and make sure you're hearing us okay, uh, letting us know that everything's A-OK -okay there in technology land. Um, so I'm coming to you live from Spring Garden Avenue here in Lakewood. Sitting next to me are my three dogs. So if you hear them barking, uh, they're just saying hello and that they're thanking you for spending your Saturday morning with us. <laughs> Um, so, uh, as Ian mentioned, we are here today with uh, our Knowing Your Home Garage Repair and Replacement webinar, uh, and we have some wonderful panelists with us today. We have John Turner, who is a friend of Lakewood Alive. You've met him a few times. He's done our plumbing and electrical, um, several other workshops, uh, has a ton of knowledge, and is here to spend his morning with us today. So thanks, John, for joining us. Uh, we also have Avi Selva from Cleveland Lumber, uh, and a huge shout out to Cleveland Lumber. Thank you so much for being a sponsor of our event and a huge supporter of our volunteer projects. Uh, they are an amazing partner here in Cleveland, and we're lucky to have them. Welcome, Avi. Good morning. Thank you. And then we also have Chris Parmalee, who is the Assistant Building Commissioner for the City of Lakewood. Uh, Chris is an awesome partner, helps us get things done, especially with our volunteer projects and also assisting our clients, ensuring that we can get projects completed quickly, efficiently, uh, and obviously code compliant and correctly. So uh, Chris is here to answer code questions and other questions we may have specific to the City of Lakewood and garages. Thank you, Chris, for joining us today. Oh, no sweat. Thanks for having me. Um, so, Ian, are we getting a lot of hands raised? Is everything okay? Yes, we have a lot of hands raised, and I believe we are uh, good to go. So I'm going to proceed to the next slide if you're ready to go, Allison. Awesome. So we're going to turn it over to John Turner uh, to kick us off uh, and get us in the mindset. I believe I could be wrong in the order. I apologize. Uh, I think Avi actually is going to start here with Garage Anatomy. That's correct. Okay, everyone, good morning, and thank you very much to Lakewood Alive um, for putting this together. Um, I know it's interesting circumstances right now, but I think we're going to have some fun and make the best of it. Um, typically, when we start speaking about garages, we like to look at the anatomy of a garage. Um, it's important to look at this and understand it because a lot of the repairs that we end up seeing in our store um, have multiple variables to them. So for example, uh, the mud sill or the sill plate that we see at the bottom, kind of in the middle of this a cross section of a garage. Um, on occasion, we'll see some customers come in and say, hey, the the siding at the bottom near this mud sill is kind of rotting away or pulling away. And that's a very common occurrence with a lot of garages that were built around 1950 and thereafter, um, mostly because of the drainage of water and some of the Unfortunately, the penetration of water to those bottom courses, especially if we have flowers or anything else near that. Um, typically, what we see is that those bottom two courses of siding are either pulling away or delaminating or just they're just really swollen from the water. Um, the reason why I emphasize this is that probably about 70 to 80 percent every summer in the spring, we get uh, customers who come in and say, hey, this this siding is pulling away or if it's not, if it just looks really terrible and we always ask the customer well what does the sheeting underneath look like because usually there's more than just what's on the surface and that's why it's important to look at this cross section because behind the mud sill you have um, a building paper or some type of vapor barrier that was hopefully installed at some point or another um, which is a layering effect on um, garages and just structures in general so if the siding were to fail the, the building paper is there to kind of hopefully be the second um, layer of defense there for you 
And then finally, you have the actual exterior sheeting. Hopefully, you don't get to the point where the exterior sheeting is rotting away or has any water damage. Hopefully, we've caught it before that. But it is a common occurrence. As you move up the structure, up the wall, um, we have a, uh, quite a few customers that come in asking about the fascia. This is the uh, piece of wood or material that kind of borders the roof lining, if you will. Um, it's another common occurrence with repairs that we see in the store. People that come in and say, hey, that's also rotting away or it's starting to fall off or uh, some of the paint is failing as well. And I will say at this point in the presentation that your number one defense in terms of your garages is the paint. That's probably the best defender of the elements. Um, I know some paint manufacturers say that they have a 10 year warranty or a six year warranty. Um, we safely say in our store that it's probably every two to three years that you probably need to touch up the paint at some point on, on most structures that are facing the elements 365 days a year. And so keeping that in mind is also an important part of this garage anatomy as we're diving into it. Um, as we move up the structures from the fascia, we have those shingles and the drip edge and the, and the roofing felt that are, again, these are the internal defense systems, but we also have the shingles as well that's protecting our structure. Any part of this structure can be infiltrated by water, wind, rain, wind-driven rain. So we see a lot of different variables come into the store, about, excuse me, very different problems that come into the store often. Um, and it's literally a quick fix or sometimes it's just like an hour project on the weekend just to kind of button something up, plug a hole before it becomes disastrous or worse in the end. Um, but the garage anatomy is important to look at because, again, as we move from the outside in, we can see the different mechanisms that are put in place and the different layers that are put in place to keep things where they're supposed to go. On some occasions, we get uh, questions about garage door headers. Now, we have a header in this picture over a window. So we have the same framing element over the garage door that kind of keeps everything in place and that garage door is um, protected by that header and maintains its structural element the garage does with this header on occasion we have some customers who come in and say hey you know the the header is starting to bow or i've got this piece of wood now that's almost hitting my garage door um, and on some occasions it's failed completely in which case somebody has tried to buttress that wrap uh, excuse me that header with a post of some type or something else so that's another common occurrence, um, depending on what kind of structural element was used at the time. It could have been a, a, some type of framing lumber that was not appropriate to use there. Other times it is rot. It is just the moisture getting into the framing members and unfortunately causing that to fail. So garage door headers are something that we replace often. Nowadays we have um, engineered lumbered products that allow us to, first of all, reinforce that part of the structure, but also um, gives you some different guarantees in terms of weight rating and not having to put a post in place. Um, I see a lot of garages in, in Lakewood, especially um, where maybe down the way a customer has installed a post in the middle of the garage. Um, we've been able to assist a lot, of a, a lot of customers coming up with different solutions so that they don't have to install that post in the middle. They can install some other engineered products to help with those rafters, excuse me, to help with those joists and kind of shore everything up from the header all the way through to the end of the garage. Any questions so far? So Avi, I'm going to just put a brief hold there for just a moment. Um, again, thanking all the people for joining us today and just reminding people we are taking questions. Uh, you'll see on the right side of your screen a little um, text box with a question mark in it. If you want to click on that, you can uh, enter questions there. Ian, our control guy, will get those questions and let them or read them to us. And then underneath that, you'll see a thought bubble with three dots in it. That's communications coming from Ian. So if you see anything, he just sent one that said, hi, friends. Feel free to ask questions by clicking on the thought bubble just reiterating what I was saying. So please feel free to submit questions uh, throughout this and we will interject them as we see fit or at the end. Thank you. And Thank great you. job, Avi. Now we're going to move on to John, I believe. 
Hi, good morning, uh, John Turner. I'm a, a retired contractor uh, and spent uh, quite a number of hours uh, diagnosing and, and repairing garages uh, over the years. Um, and as uh, Avi had mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of the structure of a garage is very similar to that of a house. It's just, you know, perhaps a little smaller scale and, and typically it's uh, not conditioned, which means it's not heated or, or, or cooled. Um, just one general comment <clears throat> for the audience is that in Lakewood, you need to bear in mind that our housing stock is, you know, somewhere, well, average 80 years old, plus or minus 20 years, depending on, you know, where you are and so forth. Um, the garage that you're probably looking at in your backyard is not probably the garage that was originally built. Uh, with the with the property, um, it may have you know the the old bones, but it was probably modified um, along the way. Uh, for instance, the uh, the roll up door uh, or the overhead door, as we call it, uh, that that was that came around you know quite a bit later, uh, probably in the 50s. Uh, prior to that, you had barn doors, um, and if you've got a single garage, you had two doors. If you had a double garage, you had four barn type doors with a post in the middle. And then somebody somewhere along the way probably removed that post and put in an overhead door. Um, same if you, some of you are gonna have what's called the tail fin bump out at the back of the garage, uh, which uh, just as the, the, the term uh, implies, is that when the larger automobiles, you know, post, post war, World War II came around, they were considerably longer uh, than what would fit in the garage that was perhaps originally built. Um, same with the pad. Most of you probably have concrete pads in your garage that may not have been original to the garage. And if Ian could uh, go to slide four quickly for me, I think I can show you how that can get done pretty badly. Um, in slide four, you will see a couple of things. One, you'll see some framing elements, the mud sill uh, and some of the studs beginning to rot and fail, causing the buckling that Avi also mentioned. But if you look at that mud sill, you'll see that it is sitting flush with the pad, the concrete pad, which means that that pad was poured in after the garage was constructed, not prior to. Um, I've, I've seen that in the past on um, several occasions and, and that can cause problems. Um, we also have what's uh, known as the Lakewood lean. Your garage is leaning one way or the other. Um, that I think is is due to what Avi also mentioned about the structural element of the header across the garage door being kind of the, the weak link in the system. Um, so it's, maybe that header was appropriately sized and, and installed when the garage had the barn doors, but you now add a overhead door. Um, and if you've ever had the pleasure of dealing with an old wooden overhead door, you know how heavy even a single garage door can be. Um, and you do that to a double garage or a two car garage, and that door can literally weigh 800 pounds. Well, now all of a sudden you're trying to support 800 pounds overhead and that garage was just never really um, originally designed to handle that. So you couple that with the fact that if you're lucky, you have sheathing on your garage, but a lot of garages were built with what's called shiplap or Dutch lap siding, which one of the uh, quote unquote advantages of that was that you could get away without sheathing. Well, that's good on the one hand, but on the other hand, sheathing also provides a lot of lateral structure to um, to any uh, home, garage, whatever. And when you don't have that sheathing um, and you overload that structure, the lean is us the usual result. So, so just you know, just bear those things in mind. Um, the ages of your garages in general, they are at or near or perhaps beyond the end of their uh, useful service service life. Uh, lucky you that you happen to own the own the property now and, and you know get to deal with this. So you need to, and again, that's you know the the title of this program is uh, repair or replace, and how do you decide? And that is 
not an easy question. Um, it's driven by a lot of things. And I think Avi is going to speak to this later. Uh, the cost of replacing a garage, and that's, you know, it's often the right answer, but it's not necessarily always possible at the moment. Um, but I think a decent new garage with a new pad uh, is probably going to be a minimum of 10000 And then you go up from there, depending on, you know, what you want to do do with that garage and Avi feel free to correct me uh, you know later when we're talking about uh, new garages um, so you know if you have to repair or the damage isn't you know so severe you can repair um, if you are a good DIYer um, and think you've got some skills understand that garage repairs um, are an intermediate to an advanced skill um, you're dealing with a structure that is not the most stable thing in the world and if you start cutting away at things and jacking things up and so forth and you're really not understanding the load paths and so forth of the, of the structure you could end up hopefully just bringing the whole thing down um, on itself hopefully not you and hopefully not against your neighbor's garage which is the reality in lakewood they tend to be pretty close together um so the, the garage repairs, structural repairs are probably not the place to practice your, your carpentry skills, um, unless you've got a good uh, experienced coach, somebody there helping you that knows, knows what they're doing. Um, so sans that, you're bringing in a contractor um, to you know, help you diagnose what's going on and so forth. That was my job back in the day. Um, I can tell you when I'd walk into a garage, uh, the first thing I would do is identify you know well you ask the customer why am i here and they'll typically point to the roof and say it's leaking and things are rotting out and so forth um my next thing was to then look down and take a look at that mud sill area uh to see what was going on there because frankly again given the age uh, of these structures putting a new roof on a 80 to 100 year old structure um, is often like putting lipstick on a pig um so now maybe you have to because you don't have the, the the funds available to to do what's needed but just understand that you know you're 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 probably in for a little more than than what you you thought so again coming back to that uh, slide number three and four you see some rot you see some siding buckling um i have in the past been able to arrest that uh, a little bit, uh, at least by, you know, people a few years um, to start, you know, gathering up the funding needed to do what would be the right answer, and that's replace it, uh, by using borates to treat the sills and the, and the framing members in general to try to stop the bugs, kill the bugs, so forth, um, you know, try to arrest it. Understanding that if you're going to do that kind of a treatment, uh, you then need to go back through and use stainless steel fasteners, nails, long screws, and so forth uh, to refasten all of those studs to that sill because the borates will eat the mild steel fasteners that every you know that all of these garages were built with. So, in other words, you know, be careful. Read the directions on the on the treatment that you're using. Um, hey, if you have a lot of yeah. Could you talk a little bit about what a borate is and where you would find that? Right. Uh, borates are, a, are kind of a natural uh, insecticide, fungicide. Um, it's a salt uh, at the end of the day, and which is why it eats uh, mild steel. And you have to, you know, use, we'll say hot dip galvanized or, or stainless steel is truly the right answer uh, when you're using, when you're treating lumber with borates. Um, so, and it's, you know, it's available, I don't know if Avi, if they carry it at Cleveland Lumber um, or, or normally the big boxes, I've always gotten it, uh, gotten it online from a, from a specialty house. Um, so I'm not real sure on, on where you would procure it, but I would imagine, um, and, and Avi, jump in if you know that uh, Cleveland Lumber carries, carries it. Honestly, John, we don't really carry any of those products like that. Um, not anymore. I think at one point we did, but their popularity has really waned in these last few years. Yeah, gotcha. 
Gotcha. John and Avi, so, if I may, for just one moment, please. Uh, we just have yeah. a couple of questions, and so I thought this might be a good chance as the two of you are speaking to interject. Uh, uh, Alex uh, and Lindsay both have asked a question around the cost of a single car garage, uh, saying would it be approximately ten thousand dollars for a you know a standard either single car or two car. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, uh, Lindsay notes they have a one car garage and they're thinking of tearing it down and putting up a one and a half garage, uh, car garage. You know, would the estimate still be approximately the same? Hmm. So we are going to get to that, I think, if we want to just maybe hold those for just a moment. Okay. Great. We do have a question around structural uh, integrity of the garage. Uh, if we um, can jump in on that for just a moment, and then we can uh, either hold or, or answer. Uh, David's asked the garage is structurally sound, uh, the studs, sills, headers, rafters, etc. But the concrete floor is cracked. Is it possible to just remove and re-pour the concrete floor without replacing the entire garage? Yeah, um, I a lot of these garage uh, um, pads and so forth that I've seen are there's cracks, and that can be you know just. A lot, a lot of times the uh, the uh, wire mesh or the rebar that may have been used, uh, if it's not put in properly, that stuff sinks to the bottom and all of a sudden you have, uh, you, you don't have your rebar structure actually in your pad. Um, so that's one typical cause. Uh, two, spalling just from salt coming off the vehicles, melting in the garage, so forth, that tends to beat up the concrete. Uh, the other thing that, that uh, I've seen a lot of is heaving due to uh, trees. Uh, being too close to the proximity of the pad. Um, I, know I had one customer, in, in one case, back in, you know, like the 70s, they had bought a live Christmas tree. And when they, you know, when the season was over, they decided to plant the, the little tree next to their garage to, you know, keep it. And, you know, uh, come around 19, uh, or well, 2000 something or other. And that, uh, that 60 foot conifer is now lifting the the back end of the pad and uh, completely warping the garage. So, you know, that's that's another thing that can can take out a concrete pad. Um, if you try to re replace just the pad, it's, you know, again, you got to do it very carefully. Um, I'm going to ask Chris if the city has anything to say about how that gets done. Um, but, you know, trying to excavate a, a concrete pad from inside of a structure, um, is is probably possible, but a bit of a bit of a risky move if you ask if you're asking my opinion. We Chris? do we we do see that uh, quite often. Um, a lot of times, the uh, you know mud sill sill plate, um, you know whatever terminology you want to use, isn't isn't sitting on isn't sitting on anything. It's sitting flush with the ground, right? Mm -hmm. So or it's a hollow red clay foundation on the garage. Mm. Um, so you have to be really careful cutting and removing that pad. Um, when you do pour that new floor in the garage, don't recommend um, doweling or attaching that slab to the structure because typically, you know, your standard two car garage isn't sitting on a footer or a foundation. Um, so you want to let that pad move independent of the garage. Uh, it's a it's it's a fix. I mean, if the garage itself is stable um, and, and structurally sound and your pad's just cracking up on you, I mean, we, we, we do see that a lot. We do a lot of pre-pours in existing garages. Just be mindful, make sure you're not throwing money in the garbage. Um, take, take a look at, you know what's around the pad and above the pad before you you know make that investment yeah sound advice sound advice uh coming back to you know the foundation pad mud John, and so forth yeah i'm really sorry to interrupt it's just a lot harder to interrupt you when i don't get to see you and show you my big smile of oh, sorry we're i'm interrupting you i'll send you a picture uh <laughs> so i was wondering uh chris if we could talk a little bit kind of about this with our neighbors and our trees and how we would handle this situation. Let's say my neighbor planted their Christmas tree next to my garage. Mm -hmm. How would we go about handling that? Well, <laughs> trees in Lakewood 
um, we absolutely do not get involved. That, that turns into a civil issue. What you could do is, you know, not use the city or the building department um, as an intermediate uh, source and, and go to your neighbor and talk to your neighbor. Um, hey, your trees, you know, even my garage, you know, what, what, what can we do about it? Nine times out of 10, um, you are the responsible party. Uh, just like if one of your neighbor's tree branches falls on your garage and crush, crushes your ridge, um, what, once that branch is on your property, it's your problem. Um, mm. Anything overhanging your property from zero to infinity, uh, you're allowed to maintain, cut back, because um, if it is on your property, you own it. So your neighbor most likely isn't going to cut that tree down and grind the stump and eradicate the roots and dig it from under your garage and level your garage out. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to, it's going to be, it's going to be that person's problem is, is the short answer. Okay, your, neighbor not, your neighbor is not, not responsible. Right. So I guess what we're taking away from that is, um, that we need to just knock on our neighbor's doors and talk to them and see what we can do. And if we aren't able to make much progress with them, we just need to take care of the stuff that's on our side and do the best that we can. That's about all you can do. And then I, on the other hand, you know, you, you raise your garage because, you know, it's, it's beyond its mechanical means. Um, and there's that tree that's right on top of where it used to be. And you have, you know, it's a uh, old growth, you know, pin oak or, or something. So it's got some pretty substantial root structure. You really have to be careful and your contractor has to be careful if you're hiring out that they, they pay special attention to the size of those roots that they're going to go through to put that garage back. Um, at the end of the day, if that, if that tree is on your neighbor's property, you know, the roots are on yours, you can maintain it. <clears throat> We've seen it where it actually killed the tree before, um, and that's the last thing you want to do because then, you know, if you right. cause property damage on the other side, you're you're liable for that one. So there's all kinds of fun <laughs> stuff you got to keep in mind. Thank you. Right. <laughs> um, uh, so I do have a question, John, from the audience that does relate to what we're talking about here. Someone has asked, what if your sill is completely disintegrated and your posts are now sitting on the dirt? Yup. So um, you, you can you can literally pick up an entire garage, uh, suspend it in the air, replace all of that framing, and then drop it back on, on the pad. It's been done, I've been involved in, I, I've done one or two walls uh, that way um but you really have to understand structure and gravity and, and uh and wind for that matter if you're going to start you know suspending walls um to do to do repairs so forth um it, it it's all doable it's just time and money uh if you don't have the jack to replace it and you've got to repair it then get yourself a good contractor understands these things and, and and how to do it and again as chris pointed out with the trees uh you know and, and being so close proximity to your neighbors and so forth these garages are the same way um you you drop a garage over this you know <clears throat> collapse a garage you better hope it comes straight down on itself um and doesn't go left or right into or back into into one of your neighbors um insurance company gets a whiff of you know a diy or dropping a garage on, on, on somebody else's property and, and they're gonna wash their hands of you. So it can all be done, um, you know, yeah. I mean, the picture, uh, again, three and four, um, I know what's gonna be required to do that and that's lift up that wall, excavate all of that framing and so forth out of there, reset it, uh, re rebuild it, and then reset the, the garage back down unless we wanna, you know, decide to completely drop the garage and, and, and start from scratch. Um, so yes, it can be done. But again, uh, if, if, if you just need time to 
collect the funds for the right answer, which is replacement, there is some things, and I started in on that with, uh, you know, again, treating those those uh, timbers with, with borate to at least arrest the rot. Um, the other thing that I've done quite a bit of is to take those first few courses of siding that's buckling uh, anywhere from six to 10 inches, depending, and replace that with PVC lumber uh, using what's known as a Z flashing between the siding and the, and the top of that PVC uh, fascia board to give the garage protection from, you know, snow load against it, uh, which is typically where the rot starts down low like that. Um, and, and just to try to buy them, buy the customer some, some time. Again, these repairs, you know, depending on how bad it is, you say, look, you either got six, six months or you've got 60 months <laughs> before this, you know, you're gonna run out of this repair and you need to, you need to do something else. Does that answer okay. the question? Yeah, I believe, well, I, if that was your question, please, if we didn't answer it, let us know. Um, so basically the long story is, you know, do your homework, you know, see if you want to bring, if you want to go to the trouble of, you know, lifting up if your garage is in really good shape or if it's worthwhile then to just rebuild. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it, it, that's correct. I mean, again, just given the age of these structures, they, they we're, we're past, you know, just well, I mean, there's some things that, that were done poorly. I mentioned the overhead doors. That's that's a real liability, uh, just from a weight standpoint. Um, and again, if you're trying to extend the the life of the structure before you have to replace it, if you have an old wooden garage door and that thing is in tough shape, well, maybe you feed it a lightweight steel or fiberglass door to take some of the load out of it. Um, the other thing that I run into is that people tend to overload the rafters and and uh, ties in their garage by hanging, you know, uh, kayaks and bicycles. And it's amazing what people will stick up there. Um, again, those garages were never meant or designed uh, to handle those kinds of kinds of loads. And that will definitely contribute to the Lakewood lean. Uh, poorly constructed bump outs at the back um, takes a lot of lateral uh, stiffness out of the back of the garage um, <clears throat> when you put those in. So all of those just, you know, slowly erode away the capabilities of that structure to, to hold itself up. <clears throat> I've had some success in the past, uh, especially with garages that have a, a pretty good lean. Uh, if you have enough space, if you have at least, you know, 18 inches on either side of your garage door, if you look at uh, panel two, if you can bring that up, that space on either side of the garage door, if that is where the lean is, um, and you have at least you know 18 inches on either side of that, you can jack that thing square again, uh, straight up and down, and then put in uh, plywood uh, uh, shear panels um, to kind of straighten it up. Uh, and again, that's buying you time. Um, it's not the it's not the you know the final solution, but it it can you know can buy you again anywhere from one to one to six years thereabouts before you you have to revisit it. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so we do have some questions coming in. Do you want to keep moving forward, or do you want to keep taking those questions? Are they repair questions, or or they are repair questions. If there's specific, you know, procedural stuff, let's save it for the Q&A at the end. Um, I think I've kind of, unless the other two panels would like me to talk about something else repair-wise, I think we're kind of at the end of the repair, so you need to decide whether you're going to repair the thing, buy yourself some time, um, and or move on to replacement. We should probably talk about replacement. Um, and then at the end of that, if they want to come back and, you know, Q&A on, on specific repair procedures, I'd be happy to do that. that. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah, I agree. I think so, yeah. So these questions that are coming in are great, uh, but I think we're going to move on for the moment and then come back to them. So John, you can go ahead if you'd like. Well, I think I, it, unless uh, somebody would like me to talk about something else in terms of repair, um, well, as, maybe as specific to garages, then I think we should probably move on to new. Okay, before we do that, hey, Avi, do you want to talk about siding yeah. and the different options that are available uh, at Cleveland Lumber? Sure. 
so in terms of the siding, um, the exterior wall cladding for that matter, uh, a lot of our garages here in Lakewood are either the old school uh, shiplap and shiplap can be interchangeable to a, a Philly drop and that's the stuff that has like a little cove at the top of it or it's just a beveled siding. It's just a lap siding right over one another. Um, very common in and around Lakewood and in Cleveland for that matter. So we sell most of that product there. However, most customers that visit us, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, um, they come in with questions regarding the bottom two or three courses of that siding already rotting away. So they do have man-made products, uh, like a fiber cement board product that you can replace those first three or four courses with that are a little more immune to rotting. Um, they do have their own install detail. However, for the most part, uh, especially during the summer, we, we get a lot of customers that want to completely replace that that uh, siding with a different type of product that has really no maintenance to it and attached to it, I should say. And most of those customers end up converting to vinyl or again, some other type of man-made product to reduce the maintenance over the long term. Great. Um, so do you have, so some of our garages have fiber board. Uh, do, you, do you carry that? We do carry it. Are we a fan of it? Not really. Um, it is again a 1950s, 1960s product, 1970s product. Um, it is literally what it sounds like. It is compressed cardboard that has been shaped into a piece of siding. It's usually primed on one side, which is the face side that is facing the exterior. The back side of it, unfortunately, is unfinished. It has no primer on it. So that's, of course, as soon as a drop of water hits the back side of it, it acts like a sponge and it absorbs all the moisture around it. So we're not really huge fans of that product. We carry it because for some customers that just need one or two boards, we have it, but we're really not crazy about it. Um, as far as replacing it, again, it's a, a typical uh, reinstallation. You just have to remove the old product, install the new one. Uh, for some customers, they, they say, hey, you know, the new one is a little bit thinner than what I have up there right now. And it, and, and now the new board is, uh, the older boards are proud of the old, older, uh, excuse me, the older boards are proud of, the, proud of the new one. So they're a little bit thicker. And we always remind people that, unfortunately, those older boards have absorbed a lot of moisture over time. So that's another element that you, that you have to end up dealing with when you install new product into some of the older product and it's matching up to one another. Um, but the long story short there is that, yes, we do carry some of those products. Are we fans of it? Not really. Okay, thank how about, you. How about, how about T111? Do, do you see much of that anymore, Avi? We do. I mean, um, the T111 that we see um, is kind of coming back in vogue for some reason. I don't know why. I mean, it's, I, I, think, I mean, again, I, I'm a young, I'm not young, but... I'm in my late thirties yeah. and I think of T one eleven and I go, Hey, that's like disco era stuff exactly. you're putting up. Yeah. <laughs> so but, what um, is what's T one eleven for us lay people? It, so T one eleven is that go ahead. go ahead, John. Go ahead. No, it, it's it's basically a, a sheet good. So you it comes in, you know, I think four by eight, four by eight or four by tens. Um, and it lets you uh, sheet out a garage. Uh, very very quickly, it's it's what we call uh, board and and batten. Uh, so it comes together. Some of it's tongue and glue. Then you put a small one by two, one by three strip, depending on your you know your aesthetic, vertically to 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 cover them together. Um, but it's it's really horrible lumber. Um, and just like that fiber board that Avi was mentioning. Uh, it's it's untreated on the inside. It gets a hold of any moisture, and all of a sudden, it just rolls up or curls up and blows off the side of the side of the garage. Um, fortunately, it's cheap and relatively easy to replace. Um, but I'm sorry, yeah, I've, I've I've dealt with a lot of it in the past. Um, I'm sorry to hear that it's coming back in vogue. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully it has, it and and. It 
and I think it's driven a lot by the modern farmhouse look that everyone is going for right now. Yeah. Um, it's really come back into style. Is it great? I mean, it can be because it's a sheet instead of individual pieces. So you have less infiltration, less, less themes, but it comes with its own bag of right. detail that some people don't really consider. Yep. Indeed. So, um, okay, we do have some questions here about doors, garage doors. So um, we will be talking about new styles uh, in a few slides, but if we could talk about, uh, we have a question from Joseph. He says, is it worth it to repair heavy old or old heavy barn doors on your garage that are rotting at the bottom? And if so, how do you do it? Uh, oof. It's a, no. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Unless you really like the look of those barn doors, um, if they're in if they're in tough shape, uh, it's time for them to go. Probably be my answer. Um, the the only caveat I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to throw this in here. Um, we'd all love to think that our pads are nice and flat and don't have a smile, either a frown or a smile to them. Uh, but that's typically not true. And the nice thing about, and probably the only nice thing about a wooden garage door is that you can then cope the bottom of the door to, to follow the changes in the, in the shape of the pad, whether it's a overhead door or, or a barn style door. Uh, you, don't have that ability uh, in a steel or or fiberglass fiberglass door. So, um, and that can be pretty disappointing for a customer who has a, a door replaced with a steel or a fiberglass, and then they find out that you know they got big gaps either at the end or a big gap in the in the middle, and not much they can do about it. Okay, and then along with that, Mary is asking if it's a possible to effectively replace a garage door seal. And uh, the seal, the garage is, um, right, okay, so we just want to know if it's possible to effectively replace a garage door seal. Uh, yeah, absolutely, did a ton of them. Um, and whether it's the bottom seal against the pad, or whether it's the uh, casing seal um, around the door, uh, all of that stuff is, a, I'm, I know Cleveland's got it because that's where I'd get it. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Okay, and uh, we have a more specific question that we may hold to the end. Uh, so Mary, we will get back to that, the other part of your question. All right, so I believe now, uh, unless there are any other questions about replacing um, that are not super specific, I believe we're going to move on now to uh, garage replacement. Okay, so starting on slide 11 now, um, we have under consideration now a complete garage replacement. So as, as the discussion has already uh, alluded to, we've come to the we've come to the conclusion that unfortunately the garage repair is not the most economically viable option at this point. So now you are faced with the question of how to know when to replace, but also when to finally decide um, it's time for a new garage. So some of the considerations that we have on here, and, and I think I'm on slide 12 now, um, in terms of the styles of garage, so we have a single car garage now, Single car garage can be considered a, a number of different formats. A uh, 16 by 20 could be considered a single car garage. A 20 by 20 could be considered a single car garage because some people like to have a, like a work area or a studio or part of their garage is uh, it's kind of dual purpose. Um, you also have a one and a half and two car garage. So again, depending on what your intended use is, also in, in consideration now since you are going to be replacing the entire structure, you can now build in some of those extra features like a an attic uh, storage um, option mm -hmm. as well um, or a bump out or a or some other type of um, added um, option so that you can store uh, your items maybe a 
trash cans, uh, lawn mowers, any type of equipment or anything else that you might need just to add extra storage either to your home or to the garage. Um, some of these considerations, of course, so these options come with are, with a budget, of course. Um, in terms of the styles of garage, um, typical just a uh, gabled roof. Uh, style is probably the most popular that we see shipping into Cleveland and Lakewood and the surrounding areas. However, uh, some people will elect to, some customers elect to have a little bit more flair on their garages, if you will. So they'll elect for like a gambrel roof, which means it looks like kind of like an old school barn. Um, Robert, not something that we see every week. Go ahead. Uh, if, Ian, if you uh, bring up panel 15 that shows all the styles that he's, that Avi's talking about right now. Correct. This one is this one you're looking for, John, or where where are we headed? So it's Ian, the one that has it's uh, black and white and has like six different styles of roof. Yeah, slot. panel fifteen. Right here. There we go. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So these are the different styles you can choose from. Um, of course, our most common one is the gable style, the top right-hand side. Um, you also have a hip that, again, is something that just adds a little bit more flair to, to, the, to the garage. However, the gambrel and gable are probably our most popular ones because it allows for added height into the roof, allows you to build in some storage as well, and just gives you that added just height in general overall to accommodate any changes or any um, added features that you'd like to see there. Um, so when considering what kind of garage you're going to build, um, as John has already mentioned as well, pouring the pad first is probably the most, um, probably the smartest way to go. And usually the garage builders who you hire will tell you that as well, that pouring, the, pouring a brand new pad, having a fresh pad poured is probably the best course of action at that point. You pick your style and you pick your um, size, overall size of the garage. And then of course, now you have some finishes to consider um, whether or not you want new, uh, a different type of exterior sheeting. Again, we will talk about T111 as well. Again, it's come back into vogue for some reason. We're not crazy about it, but vinyl siding is of course um, an excellent option as well. You even have shake vinyl siding uh, nowadays that looks and feels just like the the wood counterpart however hardly any maintenance is required for some of those man-made products um, you have a choice of shingles now you can choose the color of the shingles to match the siding or use it as an accent piece now to the to the structure and finally garage doors in terms of overhead doors and then entrance doors some garages don't have a side entrance door so it's this opportunity now to add a, a new entrance into the garage instead of the overhead door having to pull that up every time you want to enter your garage. Um, in terms of other considerations now, um, you may want to insulate this garage. Maybe you want to use it as a, again, as a work area or a studio or, or some other type of structure that you can kind of work in throughout all seasons. So this is the time now to consider whether or not you want to insulate the, the walls and add sheetrock or drywall to further insulate the structure as well. Um, and as John also mentioned, um, the concrete pad um, that, another, that another attendee mentioned as well, um, cracking of the concrete pad. So this is a time for you to also consider maybe later on down the road, maybe a month or two after you build your new garage to seal it in or epoxy the floor. That way you, ha you um, add some added benefit to the floor and to that concrete pad, it'll extend the life of the pad, but also give you a nice surface to clean up. Um, for most of us, we have to drag our hoses into that into that garage and just adds another layer of protection to the floor, but also makes cleanup really easy in those in those new garages. Okay. Um, following so that next, oh, go ahead. Oh uh, no, go ahead, Abby. Um, as far as door styles, so this is a rabbit hole that many people get lost down into. And of course, the world is your oyster in terms of door styles. 
Um, doesn't really matter what you choose, it's just as long as you like it and you like the color. Uh, the only thing that I will say to keep in mind is one, the more glass that you add to a garage door, the heavier it is. Um, and typically, if you're going to add glass, you want an insulated garage door because if you're paying for glass and you necessarily don't want insulation in, in the garage, but um, typically they go hand in hand now with modern garage doors. Um, if you don't need ins an insulated garage, then you just pick a typical fiberglass or steel garage and get some windows placed into it or installed into it. But for the most part, it's what fits your budget, of course. But also just keep in mind that the more glass you add, the pricier it becomes. And in some respects, um, most customers that I tend to find that we sold garage doors with windows in them will come back a few months later and say, hey, you know, my garage door is fogging up. Well, if you park your warm car on a cold day inside the garage, of course, it's going to fog up. Just keep that in mind um, for the future as well. Um, you have a variety of manufacturers, a variety of uh, great marketing people that like to say that their garage door is the best. All garage doors really do are to close up the structure. So uh, for all, for our purposes, it's the aesthetic that you like and it fits your budget and it's not going to um, <clears throat> add any more complications to hopefully your new garage. Um, and one last point that I'll make on new garages. Um, I always tell people to reconsider exactly how much space they want in there because our lives are always expanding in some way, shape, or form. We either get married or have children or end up buying five bicycles instead of two. Just keep in mind what you can expand and what you can't expand. Unfortunately, once you build a structure, you can't really add on to it. There are ways to add on to it, but you really want to try to get that done in the beginning. Storage is a premium, especially into the attic of the of the garage or above the garage, but it's very valuable when it comes to storing um, Christmas lights and Christmas decorations and Thanksgiving and uh, fall decorations and bicycles and clothes and so on and so forth. So just keep that in mind when you're considering a new build, all of the options that are available to you then while they're building it rather than later trying to add on later. Okay, thank you, Avi. Uh, Ian, could you please go back to the slide that says do it yourself, uh, hire a contractor? It's 13. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a couple questions that I'm going to put in right now. Um, the first one I can answer is from Tino. He asks, does the city have a list of companies who do replacement? So the city of Lakewood has on their website, um, a list of registered contractors. So those are people who have provided the appropriate information to the city to be allowed to work there. Um, so you can check the website. Uh, and then you can also contact me, um, Allison at Lakewood Alive. I can help you find contractors. Uh, we do not endorse contractors, but we do our due diligence by researching the Better Business Bureau, Angie's List, uh, as, and talking to the billing department. Uh, about contractors uh, and I only give out names of people who I would hire myself so that's a good place for you to start you can also contact Cleveland Lumber or Lakewood Hardware uh, to find additional contractors as well now Chris we have a contractor or a question excuse me that says are contractors responsible for all permits including where property lines are located so permits yes if you ever have, like, preach this every time we talk, if you ever have a contractor that asks you to pull the permits for them, tell them to beat it <laughs> because you're accepting all responsibility. Um, at the end of the day, the property owner is the responsible party. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, property lines are the responsibility of A, the contractor, or B, the homeowner. Um, you're going to tell us how far your setback is off the property line, depending on, you know, what zoning district you're in. Um, so you're going to be, you know, at minimum 18 inches off the property line, depending where you are in the city. We take it as you know where that property line is. Um, people sometimes judge a fence line. Um, they go, well, my old garage was here. You know, why can't this one be there? Well, you know, because you're right on top of your, property line. You can't build on the property line. You can't build up to it. You, you need that minimum setback. But when it, 
Hang on. Why is my work phone ringing? <laughs> I'm not answering that today. Um, so yeah, it, that that is the that is the responsibility of of the property owner and or the contractor. I would always recommend, um, you know, getting the survey. They're really expensive now. Uh, it takes quite some time to get somebody out there. A survey company, they don't want to come out and just shoot one line. They're going to want to survey your whole property. You know, so you're probably anywhere between thirteen hundred and maybe two grand just to have the survey done. Um, so that's the that's the, the the short answer, I guess. That, that 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 responsibility is the homeowner or the contractor. Okay, so can we dive into that a little bit? Thirteen hundred dollars seems like a lot of money on top of your garage that's going to cost you 10 grand at minimum right so i know that if we're not we're trying to just follow the rules but if, if your garage is like your neighbors haven't complained about where your garage is can't you just go off of that you're gonna you're gonna tell us what your setback is on your plans like this package you have up right here on the screen now that i i provided i know cleveland lumber has that now too but we came up with this a handful of years ago just to make plan approval easy. Um, and there's a plot plan built into this packet. So you just, you tell us what your setback is. Like, like in, a, in a standard R2 zoning district, like, like where my house is or, or, or you, uh, Allison over on Spring Garden, that's an R2 zoning district. Your, your minimum setback is 18 inches off the property line. Um, if you go into like an R1H zoning district or uh, R1L, that minimum setback from side yard is going to be three foot. So you just is there in this packet? Is there a listing of like where everyone lives and what their? I don't know. Are? I can't remember if I put that in the packet or not. But it is up. It is on our city website. We do have a zoning map on onelakewood.com that you can look up your zoning district and and see where you are it's either going to be one of two it's either going to be an 18 inch minimum side yard setback or a three foot side yard setback okay you know, and Ian, when you click on this link does it go live it's supposed to okay well let's give it a shot and folks you may see my computer screen so uh let's see what happens doesn't online Yeah, there we go. Hey, there we go. About that, it worked. Okay, I must have a delay because mine's not working. But oh, here we go. All right, so this packet is super helpful. I wanted to show all of the slides, but obviously there's a lot of pages. So I encourage you to visit uh, this um, PowerPoint. Will go out uh, to everyone, or if uh, you can just want to write it down. But it's very simple to find if you just go onto One Lakewood dot com and search garages i believe this is the second item that comes up super easy to find and it really does lay out <clears throat> all aspects of rebuilding a garage it, it's everything if you know if somebody comes to us for plan approval and this gets filled out properly i mean it's it's guaranteed plan approval you know it's mm -hmm. not the my you know next door neighbor's a contractor and he drew this up on the backside of my kids math homework you know and it's like impossible to go through that's why I never what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah right that's why we came up with this and and it helps it for lack of better terms it dumbs it down it, it really does i mean you can everything's on there the basic garage size dimensions wing walls plot plans overhead door measurements man door dimensions it's got everything on there so that's where i would steer right. somebody off off the bat if they want to do a build right there okay so thank you so much yeah this is a great place to start um okay so we have a question here that's kind of specific but kind of fitting at this time it says most garages this is from jeff most garages i see are being built or advertised are gable roofs i want to replace my flat top roof with something similar and have a structural deck on top is that allowed in lakewood Nope. Um, so. You'd have to go through. You'd have to go through the zoning board, and they they would most yeah. likely shoot you down. Okay. And then another question um, 
from David is what are restrictions on building a garage with livable space? So li let's, you can't add a dwelling unit. Okay. Let's, you can't add a ADUs are going to be coming in the future. That's an accessible dwelling unit. All right. They're, they're going to be coming. Everybody wants to age in place. People are thinking about finishing the garages, turning into an in-law suite or something like that. That is a no-go now in our zoning code. Um, but what we'll do um, is build habitable condition space inside the garage. So home office, studio, workout room, um, you know, things things like that. But if you're going to do that and you're going to run gas into the garage electrical into the garage uh, no matter what size the garage is your price in concrete is going to go up because you have to put full footings in at that point in time right, right. if you're running mechanicals into the garage because of frost heave and, and and all that so yes you can build condition space but then that gets treated like anything else in home building if that condition space is up on the second floor and you're using that first floor to park cars in, et cetera, mm -hmm. you need to have the proper fire separation uh, in the floor diaphragm, that staircase that would lead up to that, you know, finished space that would have to have a rated door, you know, minimum inch and three eighths wood door, or 20 minute steel door. So there's, yes, you can do it, but you start peeling the onion when it, when you start getting into the code because you have a small house yeah exactly you have to treat that like you're building a tiny house essentially and that's fire separation which is another thing that we can talk about or i think that should at least be touched on um for side and rear yard setbacks can i ask you one question before we get to that please yeah Okay, so I have a question here from Joseph that asks, do you need a permit to partition part of your garage for a woodworking area? No, if it's a partition wall, um, you do not need permit. If you, the only way you'd need a permit is if that was going to pick up a load um, mm -hmm. or if you're going to run electrical in, inside that wall cavity, that would, we'd have to inspect that, yes. Okay, great. So um, I think this would be a good time then, Chris, if you want to talk about uh, any codes that maybe are new, especially that fire code safety There's, for garages. So it, it was in the 2013 Residential Code of Ohio. It was in the 2009. Um, we're on the 2019 Residential Code of Ohio now. Uh, we were, we started that one uh, July 1 of 2018 is when the Board of Building Standards rolled this one out. There, the majority of the changes in the new code are, are energy efficiency, but that's more or less inside your house. Um, the couple of things that people are, have, have misconceptions about is, is your rear and side yard setbacks, okay? The building code and the zoning code are two totally different things. You, you take one hat off and put the other one on, right? You can't enforce local codes through, through the state code. That's a big no-no. So just because if you're in an R2 zoning district and it says your minimum setback is 18 inches, that's great. You can be 18 inches. But if you are closer than three foot to the property line, not to the existing structure next door, but three foot is your fire rating dimension. And you have to have a one hour, you have to have a wall, firewall, I hate calling it that, but it's the easiest way to explain it. You have to have a firewall with one hour exposure from both sides if you're closer than three foot to the property line. No way around it. Um, there's no exceptions. Well, there's one exception, and then that's if there, it was an unbuildable lot next door. Like if you're abutting railroad property, or you know commercial property or something like that but so that firewall adds and i know avi can talk to this one it, it adds extra um, to the cost of the garage there is no fire rated plywood that you can use that fire rated plywood is non-combustible material and that's in you know for a type one or two commercial building um, it does not give you a fire resistance rating what does is type 
drywall on the inside wall. It's a UL263 sandwich is what it is. So it's five eighths drywall on the inside wall and either, believe it or not, five eighths normal standard jip on the exterior wall, which I wouldn't recommend. Um, what a lot of people use is a glass mat or a dunce glass, five eighths. And that gives you your one hour exposure from both sides. It's to protect your garage from your neighbor's side and your neighbor's property if your garage or your car catches on fire in your garage, which in the past two months, we, we, we had three of them. How many? That we had to go. How many did you have? Three garage fires like that. There was just one last weekend that the uh, car caught on fire in the garage. It was a Saturn. So those things are plastic and fiberglass. So it was like a, a puddle of a car when it was all said and done. It burned through the wall, uh, caught the neighbor's fence on fire, which burned the back wall of the neighbor's garage. It was a train wreck, you know? Oh my God. Yeah, okay. so that's why this fire resistance rating is is a big one. And the other one that a lot of people forget about, and especially, you know, the guys that have been working for a long time, is that PFG, um, the portal frame of garage, your short wall bracing, um, minimum two foot on that short wall for standard framing. They make engineered panels that you can go smaller, but it raises the cost. I'm talking about the little skinny walls on either side of your overhead door. Um, if you're eight foot to top a header, your minimum wing wall dimension is two foot. Once you get above that, that wing wall dimension increases. So what you so you're nine foot to top a header, then you're 27 inches, and so on and so on. Um, that gives you your short wall bracing. You blow the header through on both sides. That locks those short walls in, and if you sheet it properly, you get you get that lateral stiffness, that short wall bracing. So those two are the big ones: the firewall and the short wall bracing. Um, number three is when it comes to a zoning code perspective, we've lowered the restrictions on that. So it used to be 15 foot max to the peak of the garage. Um, now it's 15 foot to mid rise of the roof line. So if you took a plumb line from the ridge to the header, top of header, divide that in half, essentially, and then draw a level line, that, that dimension is 15 foot instead of 15 foot to the ridge, which allows people to, to build the bigger garage with the extra space up there without having to go, you know, through the Board of Zoning Appeals um, and, and ask for a variance when it comes to the garage height. Okay. Those, so those are big three. Can I ask one? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How about electrical out to the garage? Are you still allowed to string overhead or does it all got to be buried now? No, you can go overhead. You just let us know what you're doing. Um, it's got to be the, the you know, proper uh, UV protected cable. Um, almost, I've probably seen that once actually in, in the past like six, seven years. Everybody's going underground. It's just, it's just easier. To be honest, I just didn't know if it was caught up. Yeah. To, to, Every, everybody's tearing the yard up to put the garage in. You know, it doesn't take much to, you know, dig yourself the, you know, the trench of adequate depth to do your direct burial or run some conduit out there. Gotcha. Thank you. So, Chris, that was really wonderful information. Uh, a bit overwhelming, at least for me. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's good. It's good. But my question is, we as homeowners probably don't need to worry too much about this because this is a permit job mm -hmm. and you aren't going to approve a permit if those specifications are not met is that correct oh correct yeah this is this is more spreading spreading the word actually right so i think we just want to remember uh that we need fire safety uh, built into our garages. So when we're talking to our contractors, we can, you know, bring that up and see what they have to say. Uh, and then we have this helpful packet that will outline all of those things that we should just keep in mind when working with contractors. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I have a specific question and then Avi, maybe we can talk a little bit about kits uh, after that. 
Uh, so I have a question from Stephen. Stephen asks, our driveway is starting to crack and may need to be repaved in the future. Should that happen at the same time as a garage rebuild before or after? I would say it's smart to do it at the same time. If you have, you know, the financial means, um, you can. Concur. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the contractor, you know, I, I know a few of them, like, you know, Steve Mazzone with Godfather and uh, uh, George Wilbur and K&G Construction, the, those guys, you know, if somebody's going to do a driveway, they, they would much rather do the setup for the garage pour and the driveway call, all at the same time. I mean, the, the last thing you want to do is put a new driveway in and then do your garage and then start, you know, buggy and concrete over your new driveway. I mean, that's bad planning right there. Yeah. And so I, we, don't I, have to, yeah. we don't have to worry about the weight of the garage materials uh, once that new driveway is built? No. Okay. No. I, no. no. John, you want to you mean in a, coming in on pallets and so forth? No, there's such a load spread that it just won't be a factor. Great. Okay. So, Avi, um, so there's this magical thing called a garage kit. Uh, so, if people mm -hmm. want to do it themselves, or here's a little plug the city of uh, Lake with the schools through the high school, the West Shore Technical School does rebuild garages there are a lot of people on the list but if you can get your act together your plans approved i understand you kind of move up quickly on that list but i do know that that west shore tech uses kits uh, to build garages in people's backyards. so could you talk a little bit about that sure so mike dowd is the director of that program and he um i'm sure chris you know who that is correct oh i know mike well yeah we're golf buddies okay <laughs> okay there you go so Mike Dowd uh, is the skipper on that on that ship, for that matter, and um, we probably see, on average, maybe a garage build from them, maybe one every 45 to 60 days throughout the summer, and they literally just order the kit as required, um, meeting all those fire codes and all those fire requirements. Um, the kits that we sell. Again, they depend on the size of the kit, but they range between, let's just say, 4,000 and 7,000. Um, typical two-car garage, 20 by 20 garage, probably right in that 4,000 to $4,500 range. Um, and their program is a, a nice turnkey program where the students get to learn from, from the um, building of this garage. They, they tackle it kind of as a small home slash a garage. And Mike is there overseeing the entire project, of course. It's built to specification, as Chris just confirmed. Um, and, I mean, again, it's a successful program because they, we hardly hear any problems coming, if ever, any problems coming from them building a garage. Um, I can't even think of a time that they even came back for something else that, we, that was missed or needed. Um, it is a good program. It, it, it's one program that you can look at, but I know there is, as you mentioned, Allison, a kind of a long waiting list right now for them to work on it because it is high school students working on it. Right. Um, yeah. But it is. I, wanna, I, I just need to add one thing when it comes to the permitting when the high school builds the garage. That is the only time the homeowner obtains the building permit. Hmm. Correct. So the, the, the homeowner is the general contractor on their project when the school builds it. Um, that is the only time that the homeowner secures permit when somebody else is building the garage. Great, thank you. Um, so the kits, about how much do they range for one or two car garage? And what kind of flexibility so with them? So typically, again, right around the 4,000 to 7,000 range. The 7,000 range is if you want to add a, a ton of options on that in terms of um, insulation, um, storage, different different rafter choices to to um, excuse me, different joist choices to sustain that weight, or different truss engineered truss options for storage. Um, so you have I mean, literally a thousand different combinations that you could probably order. And in terms of, of a kit, 
um, especially one that's been trussed already. In, a, in other words, you're not building it rafter by rafter, joist by joist. You're buying these engineered trusses that are um, made by a manufacturer and they do comply with code. And for some garage installers like George Wilburn that was mentioned and um, Godfather Garages, Steve Mazzone, they typically end up um, most of the time ordering a trust roof garage just because it's an easier and quicker um, install, but also hits all those top top of the list check marks um, in terms of compliance and building code. Great. Um, so Charlene is asking, does the school also do the concrete work for the garages? That's not correct. Uh, you do have no. to hire a contractor to pour the pad. Yep. Uh, and from my understanding, that's part of the holdup for a lot of people on the list. Uh, they do, uh, the school is actually waiting on the homeowner to get the concrete poured. So yeah, those, those concrete guys, they get, they get booked up super early. I mean, it's, it's going to take some time. I mean, especially if you want to use one of the local guys that, 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 that are on the registered list that have been around for a long time. Um, it's, it's going to, I would plan a year in advance yeah. to be honest. Yeah, with you. exactly right. I mean, that's, that's the thing with contractors uh, is that the better they are, the more booked up they are. Yep. You know, and, that, and that's almost the, the best way to kind of, that a contractor is you you wanted to be booked out six plus months yeah if you got the guy that says he'll be there on saturday i'd, I'd be a little Not nervous <laughs> <laughs> um let's okay so uh troy is asking where's the link for the kits that the west shore students use so avi do you have anything on your website or could you give us a link or people should just call you to learn more about kits um so they can call certainly the front desk the sales desk to learn more about the kits as far as what the program offers i don't have a link for that i'd have to probably find that um because somehow, some way, everyone gets a hold of Mike Dowd's phone number and they just contact him directly. Yeah, so there is not a web page for the getting on the list. You will have to contact Mike, Mike Dow at the West Shore um, Tech. Uh, we can send out that link um, or at least the web page or maybe Ian, uh, if you have the ability to look that up. Um, we can send that out, but we don't have anything to do with the list or how you get on the list. Um, we just are always told to contact Mike Dow, um, Mr. Dow at the West Shore Tech. Yeah, we're kind of trying to find something for everybody, okay, Allison? Thank you, Ian. Okay, so um, I do want to swing back around, and I'm not sure who wants to answer this question, maybe Avi. Uh, early on in the presentation, uh, people were asking about the cost of having a garage built. So it was the single car, double car, and then the one and a half car garage. Okay, so um, this might be a question for both John and I. So as far as the material supplier on my end, um, again, these kits will range between 4,000 and 7,000, uh, depending on what options you choose and um, what door style you choose, all those other options available to you and what you choose. As far as the labor, I mean, I've seen labor prices range between 5,000 and 10,000, sometimes even 15 to 20, depending on what you're trying to accomplish there. I mean, 15 to 20 is on the higher end range, but you're probably looking at a like a ballpark between five and 10. John, you have any input on that? On just the labor? On just the labor, yes. Yeah, five, five and 10, I mean, it, it's, it, those things are so hard to, to generalize on because there's so many options uh, when it comes to, to building anything. But, uh, you know, we're talking about garages here. Uh, as we mentioned before, if you're going to use this thing as a as a workshop and it's going to be semi-conditioned, how much power are you bringing out there? How much insulation are you putting in? How much structure are you putting up top for storage? Um, so forth. Uh, you know, it, it just comes back to the proverbial, you're going to get what you pay for unless somebody, you know, owes you a favor or you've saved somebody's life or what have you, <laughs> you really get what you pay for. Um, so, you know, 
yeah, you, I've seen, you know, I wander around uh, and I see these placards in people's front yards, uh, $8,900 for a complete two car garage. And I'm like, yeah, it's, and it's going to fail in five years. Um, or, so you get to do it again. Yeah, with so, that, there's going to be a lot of add ons. It's never going to be oh, that up. Yeah, yeah. I've seen some of these cheap garages, um, I've repaired some of them. Um, you know, and I and I'm old school. You know, if, if if what's required is a two by four, I'm using a two by six, right? So, you know, I I come into some of these new build garages and I just cringe. It's just like ye cats. But so, um, but what I was saying, you know, typically on average for decent build labor wise, yeah, five to ten depending on on the details. Um, yeah. but you know, you can go up from there. I just want to add a lot of the garage companies that we've worked with, whether that's Godfather Garage or the Great Garage Company, uh, they're really great at, on their estimates, spelling out all of the costs. So if you want to splurge and add, you know, fancy gas light, lights on the front of your garage or a really fancy door, you're going to see that as a line item. And then when it gets down to it with your budget, you can remove things as you need to. Uh, to get in there. So you always just, I think, want to ensure that just with any project that you're doing, that your estimates are spelled out well, and you know what you're getting. So at the end of the day, you know what the price is going to be. Of course, there might be a little bit of change here and there, but a well-written estimate, uh, you know, as long as it gets stuck to, should be pretty much your finished price. And, and I'm going to just going to interject as as a former contractor, um, and I and I always make this statement in any of the courses that I've taught for you guys is that you're as as the consumer as as the customer your best bet on getting what you want is for you to start with a set of specifications and as these contractors come through to give you estimates say here's my specs tell me what it's going to cost to meet these specs and if you have ideas or exceptions or whatever I want you to spell them out separately and show me what the adder or the deduct is, and then we can talk about it. Because it's really easy to start chasing your tail as a, as a uh, consumer of just saying, you know, to Godfather Garage, come out and give me an estimate. And then you call the next person, come out and give me an estimate, and don't really tell them outside of one or two car, you know, and the basic stuff of, of what you want. Um, as, as Avi and I were talking uh, yesterday when we were doing our dry run, when it comes to carpentry and structures and things like this, there is 10 ways to do everything, every single step. Now, two of those ways are just dumb and liable to end up in tears or blood or both. <laughs> and then the other eight are serviceable. So, you know, everybody's gonna come in and they're gonna have their particular way that, that they either like to do it or that they've developed a system that's that uh, gives them a competitive advantage in terms of labor or materials, whatever. So you as the consumer, best place to start, do your homework. You start out with a set of specifications. Now, having done that, that doesn't mean that you've stopped learning and the customer contractor comes in and says, you know, I'm looking at your specs. Why did you, you know, want me to pour a 12, 12 inch pad? Um, you know, we're not landing aircraft here, um, you know, so listen and, and, and learn and then adjust your specification. And if you got to go back and get the estimates adjusted as you're learning and, and becoming convinced of, of either additional elements or different ways to do things, you can do so. But maintain control of that specification as the consumer, as the customer. Great, thank you. So is there anything else the three of you would like to add to garage replacement or would you like to kind of go into more specific questions at this point? I, I, I'm, um, uh, God, what was that I was going to say? I've forgotten. Age. Sorry. For the for the homeowner, it's you know, like like I always say, but buyer beware. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Um, if you think that what you're being told by by a contractor to be doesn't sound right. Um, you know, or if you have any questions, uh, you know, if they are registered, um, you know, are they insured? I mean, you can you can call us direct too. I mean, we'll be more than happy to answer those questions for you. 
And Lakewood Alive also, uh, I eat, breathe, sleep housing. If this is your first time interacting with me, I love it. So I'm happy to work with you to find contractors, bounce ideas off of whatever I can do to be helpful. That's my job. So feel free to reach out to me as well. I, I just remembered what it was I wanted to add about repair um, in, a, in a general way. And that is we really didn't talk about overhead doors and the maintenance and, and so forth thereof. Um, one one way to and and what reminded me was my comment earlier about getting getting hurt one easy way to get hurt in maintaining your garage door is if you have what we call a bar coil um, balancer on the door so you know all of these overhead doors when you lift them there's some sort of a spring mechanism that assists that kind of balances the load because you aren't going to pick it up by yourself old school high quality type of overhead door is going to have basically a couple of big coil springs right over the door and those things are wound tight so that you know this thing raises and lowers if you want to get yourself hurt go ahead and try to adjust one of those on your own not knowing what you're doing you're if you've got one of that that type of system call the garage door person and let them come out and do it i i didn't even do it as a contractor it's did it once and it scared the bejeebus out of me and I wouldn't do it again. Don't recommend it. All right. Well, that's, that's, that's a lesson there. So if John Turner is telling you that, then you need to listen. <laughs> uh, okay. So um, I'm, I, we have a few specific questions here that I want to uh, get addressed. This is for um, Chris. This is from Sarah. Based on what you said regarding side yard setbacks, it doesn't sound like my garage is under code if a replacement is inevitable does lakewood allow a downgrade in size replacing a two car with a one or one and a half car absolutely um the reason for that is the uh <clears throat> years years ago the parking code got changed um it used to say one undercover parking space per dwelling unit so if it was a double you needed two uh now it just speaks to one undercover parking space per dwelling as a whole. So if you have a two car garage that you don't use um, or you don't wanna have the, the added expense to rebuild a two car, you can go to a one car garage. Um, everybody is allowed to have a garage 480 square foot. Doesn't matter how big your yard is. Um, mm -hmm you want to go over 480 square foot or over 25 percent of your rear yard that's when you have to apply for a zoning variance but if you want to downgrade hands down have at it that's a-okay yeah. the, the only caveat to that and this has nothing to do with contracting and, and so forth but is resale value of mm -hmm. the property that's a good point john Okay, so another question that we have uh, is, uh, okay, sorry, it's a, um, okay, so my, uh, this is a question, I believe it's from Mary. Uh, my garage is approximately 18 years old, never had any issues. Within the past year, water is accumulating in the front rut right and left corners and is starting to erode the base of the track on either side of the garage door when the door is raised after a rain water drops from the garage rubberized seal i had a garage door company come out and he said the seal is good from the inside of the garage i have closed the door and on the right side light is coming in through a gap of the cement in the closed door I hate to keep calling companies to assess the issue due to the 65 to $95 just to come out. Uh, what should I do or what's my issue? John, that, that speaks to the crown you were talking about earlier exactly. where the, the exactly pad right. heave in the middle. That's exactly the situation right there. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, 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 and if you've got a, a steel or a fiberglass door, um, sometimes depending on how much room you have this this can really get out of hand quickly um because most of those doors when they're when they're installed they're 
they install them in such a way so that when that door finally comes to its final resting position in the closed position, that top panel just whoop, pushes up against the top uh, lip seal. So you don't have a lot of up to go without the thing starting to back away and look like it's starting to open. But in some cases, I've been able to tack, uh, typically, if, it, if it's a steel or fiberglass door, a piece of PVC lumber to the bottom of the door, you know, and hopefully I'm only dealing with like an inch, something like that, and then cope that bottom piece to the pad to, to get rid of those gaps. Um, it's either that or you start grinding concrete and you can do that, but then you often solve one problem and create another. Um, so that's, that's probably what's going on there. Um, and probably better off at this point, unless if you, if you can do what I just mentioned, fine. Or if it's a wood door, then you then that's easy. Then you just cope the bottom of the door and, and let it come down a little bit further. Um, but sans that, I'd get in there and just either uh, start trimming the bottom of the track. You know, and all you need is a quarter of an inch uh, to keep it out of the concrete or keep it out of the wet to stop the corrosion of the track. Um, and or just waterproof the, the materials in that corner and, and know that, you know, you're going to have to live with it. Okay. And Mary, you have a solution that I haven't thought of? No, I, it's what I would do. And Mary, feel free to reach out uh, if you need additional assistance with that. Um, you can find my contact information on the lakewoodalive.org slash about us uh, page. Um, or, you know, we can connect you to some other people who can help you answer your question. Uh, so Tino is asking, and this is probably for Avi, is there a big difference between a fiberglass or a steel door? Uh, in terms of price or just in terms of performance? Probably both. Okay. So in terms of performance, um, I mean, it's, it, it's left to opinion. Um, fiberglass or steel on the steel side um, our opinion is that it's a it's a great price point but you do have that unfortunately the ability to ding it and if not to have it rust over time a fiberglass door has better performance in some respects because it doesn't ding as easily and it won't rust but again that's kind of like a coke and pepsi kind of question um, at this point as far as pricing so Steel to fiberglass, some manufacturers are within 15 to 20 percent of each other. However, there are others that are night and day. I mean, uh, one garage door could be a 16 by 7 typical garage door. Steel could be 550, 575, and the one from another manufacturer could be easily 12 to 1500 dollars. So it just depends on what you're looking at in terms of style and how much glass you want in it and whether or not it fits your budget. Great, thank you. So Avi, anyone can call Cleveland Lumber and talk through those things or when we're no longer sheltering in place, uh, come by and visit and talk with you guys about those things? Absolutely. Great, okay. So we are nearing the end of our webinar here. So if you have any additional questions, please feel free to send those in now uh, so we can make sure they get asked. This is being recorded uh, and it will be sent out uh, after probably on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, so if you want to listen again and take notes or hear our amazing presentation, you'll have the ability to do that. Um, so I would like to wrap up um, as we're waiting for any additional questions and say thank you so much uh, to Chris, John, and Avi for spending your Saturday with us. Uh, again, um, we oh, hoped we be together in person just because we love being with one another. But uh, mm -hmm. again, we are in unique times. Mm -hmm. uh, so we appreciate you uh, jumping into this technological endeavor with us uh, and appreciate that it is a little complex and complicated. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you to everyone who has uh, signed up and listened with us today. We are so thankful for all of you. Um, Oh, yes, we do have a question here that we will get to in just a moment. Um, so we just wish you all health and safety uh, and hope that you are able to stay at home. And if not, um, you have the proper 
uh, items to keep you safe. So a question that I neglected and I apologize was uh, for John, how do we keep moss off of the roof on our garages? Uh, so um, trim the trees would be job one because that's really what the, the, the root cause of, so to speak, bad pun, uh, is that that roof is not seeing the appropriate amount of sunlight and is staying too damp and that attracts the moss. Um, if you can't or don't want to do that, then they make some products, some are topical, um, you know, you get up there and, and, and use it uh, as needed typically once, once a year, um, or uh, they make, uh, and Avi can speak to this as well, uh, I believe it's zinc strips that you can tack uh, up towards the ridge of the roof. And then as the water, uh, rain, snow, and so forth, descends upon it, it washes just a little bit of that zinc out of the, out of the, the, the strip, and that protects the roof, roof from uh, uh, moss and, and fungus. Don't go up there with a pressure washer. No. Was I was going to read. I was going to re re reiterate that, John. Please do not go up there with a pressure washer. Um, <laughs> that is probably the worst thing you can do, and we get at least a handful of people who do that throughout the summer, and it is not a good time. Hey guys, Ian here. Just in case I missed it, if you already have moss on your roof, then what should you do? very gently remove it with, with using as little effort and, and abrasion as possible. Uh, some of that's going to be driven by the, the condition of the sing shingles. If, uh, if you've let it go on too long, it's probably, probably already degraded the shingles. And then the easy way to remove the rot moss is to replace your roof, which it probably needs anyways. Um, but, you know, mechanically removing the, the moss initially gently as possible is what you need to do. And then again, go after it with either the zinc, zinc strips or a topical treatment as, as maintenance. Thank you. Okay, I, we have another question. I have, a, what, can, I have one quick question actually for Avi um, that you know, everybody listening would probably appreciate the info. Um, because we are in trying times, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to stop maintaining our properties. Um, what what is uh what what are your hours avi as of now and are you guys still delivering product so we're still operating somewhat as usual um right now our hours are, are posted on our website um, we're maintaining the same hours right now that we normally do at this time of year we only ask that um everyone limit their they're coming into the store we are definitely delivering however um our, for our deliveries, we're not going into anyone's home or anyone's garage. We're literally just delivering to the driveway right now. Okay. Um, so we do have some protocols in place that are mandated by the governor right now. And we're trying to abide by that as much as possible. But um, we are asking anybody who wants any product to just call it in so that we can deliver it. We'd rather not have anybody really coming to the store right now. And okay. if people are coming to the store, Avi, is there a number of people that are allowed in your store at one time? Correct. As mandated earlier this week by the governor, we have to post the maximum amount of people inside the store at any given time with our staff maintaining that appropriate distance from one another. And that is posted at the front of the store. We have had, um, as of Wednesday or Thursday, to really only limit that once where we just stop people from coming in for a minute or two until some people leave. Um, but that, that rare, I mean, we were, we were, I think it was just kind of a midday lunch rush that that happened. Um, but really we haven't seen very much foot traffic in these last probably two weeks or so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. We have two additional questions. Uh, so Rose asks, sills are good attached to pad. Pad has a crack. Can I fill it? Uh, it's been caused by roots and the tree is gone now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. You would fill that with what? Well, you can use, yeah, I mean, you can use a vinyl cement product or, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, those pads are not structural, really. Um, so, you know, a repair type, patching type concrete 
would, would be appropriate. Great. And Kurt, Thank guys? Yeah, yeah, uh, elastomeric something too. I mean, that, that yeah. always works. Yep. All right, Agreed. so we have a question here that says, how long does it take on average from initial evaluation by a contractor to job completion? Do you all work in the winter months as well as warmer months? Uh, and this is in terms of a garage replacement. Avi or John. So, so in general, um, just as long as it's not freezing out and the concrete can be poured, if it's, appro if it's appropriate, if you're re-pouring that pad, then yes, they work through the winter, especially this winter is pretty mild. So they were pouring pads well deep into the winter. Um, we do ship year round. Uh, really has not slowed down this winter at all. Um, and can you repeat the question one more time? Forgive me. Uh, how long does it take on average from evaluation by a contractor yeah. to job completion? So again, the good ones, they're going to be probably from initial contact to literally them handing you the final bill or the the yes, we're done. It's probably anywhere between six to eight months because again, the usual, usually the guys that are good are probably out at least that, or if not more. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I mean, John, you can chime in on that, and, and Chris as well. Yeah, exactly what you said. Yeah, we're um. So usually, yeah, the the plan plan review. I mean, it's always the city, the big bad city, jamming everybody up. But um, I mean, <laughs> right. we, we try. We we what city? I try really hard. <laughs> to keep, yeah, to keep plan review. Um, <laughs> to between 10 and 15 days. So we try to crank them out. Chris, can I can I ask, um, how are your hours? I mean, are, are you are your offices still operating as usual? So it, somehow, you know, there's a handful of guys out there that are telling their clients and, you know, customers that the building department's closed and they're not offering any inspections, which is incorrect, of course. Um, we are all working remote. I'm actually talking to you guys from uh, Control Center Parmalee uh, in, in my bedroom. Um, you know, I'm doing plan reviews from home, uh, fielding calls from home, uh, directing inspectors from home. Uh, we came up uh, about a week and a half ago um, on our new portal that we have uh, for contractors and homeowners. You, they can actually request a remote inspection now. Um, so right. depending on the project, you know, size, type, difficulty, uh, you can upload photos um, and that gets sent directly to your inspector and then they can contact you via the phone or email, whether or not that's adequate um, or, you know, if they need more information. Our inspectors are still out in the field, uh, maintaining, you know, social distancing as much as possible. I have to constantly remind contractors that don't show them your phone don't pat them on the shoulder. We're not fist bumping or handshaking anymore. Um, things have changed. The office itself uh, is primarily closed to the public as well as City Hall. We have a drop box set up uh, at the main entrance of City Hall for permit applications, plans. Um, we are accepting a lot more electronically than we used to. So you can submit plans to uh, uh, that's building.permits at lakewoodoh.net, uh, and they get filtered from there. We're really trying to maintain, you know, the expedite the customer service that we've always, you know, that, that we've worked really hard the past six years to, to obtain. Um, we're, we're really still trying to keep the contractors and the homeowners moving, keep everybody working, um, you know, keep those essential tradesmen, you know, doing their job. So we're trying. Hours of operation are Great. normal. I mean, we're, you know, 7.30 to 4.30, uh, just not in the office. You know, when, when you talk to your inspector, chances are he's typing up some stuff at his kitchen table. So we're, we're, we're really trying to maintain normalcy as much as humanly possible, I guess. That's Very good. Great. We appreciate everyone's going above and beyond uh, to keep Lakewood beautiful. 
Um, so I think we are now done with questions. Uh, you will see something come across uh, from Ian just asking, how do we do? Is there anything that we can do to improve these webinars? Our next webinar session is going to be um, Thursday, April 16th, and that's Solar 101. We'll be working with Third Sun Solar, and that's going to be roughly 7 to 8.30 uh, in the evening. And then Saturday, uh, the 25th, we will be doing container gardening uh, with uh, Lakewood Garden Center. These will all be virtual workshops again. Um, if you have signed up on Eventbrite, we will require you to sign up through GoToWebinar, but anything moving forward, you will only be signing up through the GoToWebinar link for the near future. Uh, again, I want to thank all of our presenters, Chris Parmalee, Avi Selva, and John Turner, and of course, my right-hand man, Ian Andrews. Thank you so much for all of your assistance. Uh, we appreciate all of you. And to our friends at home, please stay safe. Um, we are thinking about all of you and your families. Please reach out. You can call me. Again, my name is Allison, 216-521-0655, or you can email me at aurbanic at lakewoodalive.org. That's A-U-R-B as in boy, A-N-E-K, at lakewoodalive.org. Uh, and I think then this is the end of our first webinar. So great job, everyone. Does anyone have anything else to add? No, I just wanted to say, Avi, Chris, it was a pleasure working with you guys today. Yeah, no, this was good. You guys uh, stay healthy. I mean, that's, 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 about, it. that's about it. Yeah. We'll see you on the other side. <laughs> yeah, man. We'll, we'll, we'll get through it. It'll be fun. Oh, yeah. We'll be all right. Great. Well, uh, yeah, everyone stay Thank home. Thank you, everyone. Practice social distancing. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Take, take care, everyone. Thank you, you too. Bye. Bye. Bye.